I like the word thought line. Really, when we put this exhibition together, James Paul, who's the curator, has spent a lot of time going through uh, my papers with photographic evidence of exhibitions of you know, past and um, performances and the thought line, I guess lines, the cat's cradles, all those sorts of ideas, they're about connections, matrixes. Uh, I can incorporate the philosophical lines, I can incorporate political lines, I can weave backwards and forwards these allegorical chamber works and I can examine and interrogate the world that I live in in any one time date and that will be a record or a document. In a way, you know, being called an artist is really quite awkward. In a way, I like the fact that an artist can document the world that they live in and that there is a way of framing things which transforms the view of the world because of their intelligence, um, their assumptions about things, their instinct, all the common things of wit, having one's wit about them, will come into play. Last year I worked with Alan Sharka, uh, who's a dancer and choreographer. We began at 12 o'clock in the afternoon in his studio. We had Harry Hooten's poems um, or his philosoph philosophical poem called Directions. The aphorisms of Harry Hooten are, are absolutely amazing. It's sort of like a political guru who's, uh, I don't know how to really describe him, sort of something like, had sort of fallen between the cracks and sort of was part of Bohemian Sydney and dedicated to both philosophical and poetic vision of, of the new post-war post uh, society and, and the directions have all of those senses of well-being for a world and a criticism of, of, of peoples, people and things. He said if, the, if things were to rule the world then the world would be a great place but because people have got weaknesses and characteristic weaknesses um, that's pretty much why the world is flawed as it is today because it should be perfect. We've got the techno he calls it, a technocratic world is able to make things perfect. It's just people choose it to be imperfect. Um, they don't care, I guess that's what he's saying. And so that's what we, one of the performances we'll explore at Hazelhurst um, together again. These are uh, language paintings. It's the uh, poetics that Strello collected up. Strello's father was the Lutheran missioner at Hermansburg and he got there in 1894 and uh, had been recording the songs of Central Australia um, uh, in his five volume book Dioranda and Lorichestam in Central Australia. And his son T.G.H. Strello followed on with his father's work and I, I guess we might know Bruce Chapman's Songlines book, which is a homage to um, both uh, Carl Strello and Ted Strello's work. The Oranda and the to me, was a very important source of material, um, and I wasn't quite sure how to, how to touch upon it. What, what I do to immerse myself in this writing, or anyone's writing, is to copy the letters, literally, from the manuscripts or, or the published sources uh, onto a canvas or onto a watercolour page or um, and, and, and I go, in, a, in a way I, I start with, with a blank skin and then I start to cut in or inscribe into the, to the skin um, the characters of the poem um, and then uh, in the case of some poetries and particularly the Aboriginal poetries I decided it needed to be covered over and disguised um, that I didn't really have copyright or permission to, to work with the work and the best thing to do if I wanted to have the experience um, um, and not get into um, appropriating things which were I had no permission, no, no, no knowledge to do, I should just copy it and then disguise it, draw over the top of it. The um, 
idea was, uh, was somehow to get two sides of the story happening. In the Arenta version, um, um, that, that's readable. When they were exhibited in Alice Springs, those, those paintings, um, of, of all three of the paintings, the German, the English and the Arenta, the uh, Aboriginal people would be able to read, read the Aboriginal version. And, and Aboriginal people saw those paintings. So it was, uh, it's been a very interesting experiment, those, those, those transcription drawings. I, I ho hope that explains some of the uh, meanderings Thank on you. the surface. John Jones is a Wiradjuri Gamilaroi artist. John's been a real inspiration to me. We got an invitation to make work at Carriage Works. The curators wanted to explore the idea of people that had worked in Carriage Works, um, the people that lived in, in the neighbourhood around Redfern there. And this story is about a young man working in the wool classing, as a wool classer in the wool classing industry. And as uh, Aboriginal people, it's uh, unusual that he would have such a close relationship with the wealth building the pastoralists would want um, the wool class uh, to class the um, uh, that year's uh, uh, crop of, of wool uh, at, at the highest grade possible. But the wool classer has to be uh, uh, genuine about the grade of the wool. I look for very closely how uh, the expressions in the voice uh, talked about they and them and us and this sort of uh, position that. Um, uh, maybe the indigenous person found themselves in. And I was looking for that. Um, so that's a bit of a mystery in itself. It was, it was sort of a, a struggle and uh, uh, to find ways to keep the mystery and also to illuminate something at the same time. The analogies for The Perfect House it was a performance I made in 2005 with the Melbourne composer Rainer Lintz. We were commissioned by the performance space at uh, the old Cleveland Street Theatre. We were trying to create a poetic around displacement of those people in Redfern. So it was again this allegorical construction. I wanted to build a house inside the theatre. I wanted the audience to be inside the performance space. I started to use um, some frames, they're called the silhouettes and they're based on Yirikala bark paintings. The bark paintings you can't read anymore. They're, they're, the, what I've done is covered over all of the um, pictograms in the bark painting and what I've done is just left the skeleton of, of, the, of the pictogram blocks um, and that's what creates the structure to um, my analysis. But uh, I've shown this work to my friends up in Arnhem Land and they, they look at it and I say, hmm, these are the bones of the painting. I said, yeah, oh, that's a nice way of putting it. He said, yeah, oh, it's okay. You know, at least you're starting to learn what we're doing. I said, uh, oh, I've been careful to do that. And um, so we made them into these large timber frames as though you were looking through the uh, wall studs of a, of a building uh, before they put the plasterboard onto the wall studs to build um, solid walls and frames, a bit like the glass house, you can see through the glass and you can see people, so in the performance you could see each other through the uh, frames. One of the beautiful things that I found when we were demounting that exhibition installation, the carriers put all the frames up against one wall and while we were waiting for the trucks to come and pick everything up to take it back to the studio, this, this, this layering of the, uh, of the uh, frames created this great abstract uh, sculpture. So that, that's what we're going to try and create down there at Hazelhurst is to paint out one of the walls a dark colour like as in the theatre was and, and just let, let people look through these uh, frames. Even when we got them down from the storage the other day and they were layered across each other, there was a real, real beautiful um, geometric play going on in, in the thing. And in, in a way, by doing that, I further disguising the origin of those grids from um, the Irakala bark paintings in, um, so that they're less readable, um, because there's, there's, that, that's something I like to do. Star Shelters is the newest work um, I've made in the last um, 18 months or so. Uh, Star Shelters began as a series of drawings 
uh, while I was in hospital in Darwin after having an accident in Arnhem Land last May. Uh, strange set of drawings. I didn't have perspectival um, vision of the world for about six weeks or so. I had to draw on the side, so that changes the way you, you see and can uh, uh, draw depth into, into a work. The idea of shelter, star shelter, had come to me really um, out of a, a reading of Diane Johnson's book on Aboriginal astronomy. And I was in Arnhem Land with Diane, really investigating with the Manunga the background of Brayawa Manunga's paintings. So I, I had sort of an immersive experience in um, what, what is the poetics behind a bark painter's um, work. I started to create sculptural forms uh, by just uh, raking over the top of the, uh, the, the spaces, the, the geometry of the lines. And, and on the other hand, it was a sculptural mode because I wanted to create dense panels uh, and lighter panels beside it. I could see in the first drawings um, facets uh, on, on these angles that came from, you know, fr from the line. So I could see a sculptural form emerging. Well, I heard a great curator say, you've got to tell people this isn't real. This is uh, make-believe. It's a construction that the artist is uh, playfully putting together. I, I wanted to make the star shelter mobiles with wheels on them so that the kids could push them around. And if we put a camera up, we can make a film of this cubist sculpture coming together, growing apart. So I think it's really important that at Hazelhurst, those kids can come and play with the star shelters and climb inside them. So I, I don't know, I mean, we've got to say to people, well, this isn't real, <laughs> but enjoy it. And um, uh, thank you for coming, as we say, the theatre. <laughs>